braiding sweetgrass, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. Written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kirst Schultz. Chapter 24, Old Growth Children. We are chatting like vireos as we hike with long, easy strides through rolling stands of dug fur. Then, at some invisible boundary, the temperature drops in a cool breath and we descend into a basin. The conversation halts. Fluted trunks rise from a lawn of deep moss green, their canopies lost in the hanging mist that suffuses the forest with hazy silver twilight. Strewn with huge logs and clumps of ferns, the forest floor is a featherbed of needles dappled with sun flecks. Light streams through holes over the heads of young trees while their grandmothers loom in shadows, great buttressed trunks eight feet in diameter. You want to be quiet, in instinctive deference to the cathedral hush, and because nothing you could possibly say would add a thing. But it wasn't always quiet here. Girls were here laughing and chatting while their grandmas sat nearby with singing sticks, supervising. A long scar runs up the tree across the way, a dull gray arrow of missing bark tapering off among the first branches thirty feet up. The one who took this strip would have backed away up the hill behind her, with the bark ribbon grasped in her hands, pulling until it tore loose. In those days, the ancient rainforests spread from northern California to southeastern Alaska in a band between the mountains and the sea. Here is where the fog drips. Here is where the moisture-laden air from the Pacific rises against the mountains to produce upward of 100 inches of rain a year. Watering an ecosystem rivaled nowhere else on Earth. The biggest trees in the world trees that were born before Columbus sailed. And trees are just the beginning. The numbers of species of mammals, birds, amphibians, wildflowers, ferns, mosses, lichens, fungi, and insects are staggering. It's hard to write without running out of superlatives for those, for these were the greatest forests on earth. Forests peopled with centuries of past lives, enormous logs and snags that foster more life after their death than before. The canopy is a multi-layered sculpture of vertical complexity, from the lowest moss on the forest floor to the wisps of lichen hanging high in the treetops, raggedy and uneven from the gaps produced by centuries of wind throw, disease, and storms. This seeming chaos belies the tight, web of interconnections between them all, stitched with filaments of fungi, silk of spiders, and silver threads of water. Alone is a word without meaning in this forest. Native peoples of the coastal Pacific Northwest made rich livelihoods here for millennia, living with one foot in the forest and one on the shore, gathering the abundance of both. This is the rainy land of salmon, of wintergreen conifers, huckleberries, and sword fern. This is the land of the tree of ample hips and full baskets, the one known in the Salish languages as maker of rich women, as mother cedar. No matter what the people needed, the cedar was ready to give, from cradleboard to coffin, holding the people. In this wet climate where everything is on its way back to decay, rot-resistant cedar is the ideal material. The wood is easily worked and buoyant. The huge, straight trunks practically offer themselves for seagoing craft that could carry twenty paddlers. And everything that was carried in those canoes was also the gift of cedar. Paddles, fishing floats, nets, ropes, arrows, and harpoons. The paddlers even wore hats and capes of cedar, warm and soft against the wind and rain. Along the creeks and bottomlands, the women sang their way down well-worn trails to find just the right tree for each purpose. Whatever they needed, 
they asked for respectfully, and for whatever they received, they offered prayers and gifts in return. Notching a wedge in the bark of a middle-aged tree, the woman could peel off a ribbon a hand's width wide and twenty feet long. Harvesting bark from just a fraction of the tree's circumference, they ensured that the damage would heal over without ill effect. The dried strips were then beaten to separate the many layers, yielding inner bark with a satiny softness and a glossy sheen. A long process of shredding bark with a deer bone yielded a pile of fluffy cedar, quote-unquote, wool. Newborn babies were delivered into a nest of this fleece. The wool could also be woven into warm, durable clothing and blankets. A family sat on woven mats of outer bark, slept on cedar beds, and ate from cedar dishes. Every part of the tree was used. The ropey branches were split for tools, baskets, and fish traps. Dug and cleaned, cedar's long roots were peeled and split into a fine, strong fiber that is woven into the famous conical hats and ceremonial headgear that signify the identity of the one beneath the brim. During the famously cold and rainy winters, with a perpetual twilight of fog, who lit the house? Who warmed the house? From bow drill to tinder to fire, it was Mother Cedar. When sickness came, the people turned again to her. Every part is medicine for the body, from the flat sprays of foliage to the flexible branches to the roots. And throughout, there is powerful spiritual medicine as well. Traditional teachings recount that the power of cedars is so great and so fluid that it can flow into a worthy person who leans back into the embrace of her trunk. When death came, so came the cedar coffin. The first and last embrace of a human being was in the arms of Mother Cedar. Just as old-growth forests are richly complex, so too were the old-growth cultures that arose at their feet. Some people equate sustainability with a diminished standard of living, but the aboriginal people of the coastal old-growth forests were among the wealthiest in the world. Wise use and care for a huge variety of marine and forest resources allowed them to avoid over-exploiting any one of them, while extraordinary art, science, and architecture flowered in their midst. Rather than to greed, prosperity here gave rise to the great potlatch tradition in which material goods were ritually given away, a direct reflection of the generosity of the land to the people. Wealth meant having enough to give away, social status elevated by generosity. The cedars taught how to share wealth, and the people learned. Scientists know Mother Cedar as Thuja Plicata, the Western Red Cedar. One of the venerable giants of the ancient forests, they reach heights of 200 feet. They are not the tallest, but their enormous buttressed weight lines can be 50 feet in circumference, rivaling the girth of the redwoods. The bowl tapers from the fluted base, sheathed in bark the color of driftwood. Her branches are graceful and drooping with tips that swoop upward like a bird in flight, each branch like a frond of green feathers. Looking closely, you can see the tiny overlapping leaves that shingle each twig. The species epithet plicata refers to their folded, braided appearance. The tight weave and the golden green sheen make the leaves look like tiny braids of sweetgrass, as if the tree itself was woven of kindness. Cedar unstintingly provided for the people, who responded with gratitude and reciprocity. Today, when cedar is mistaken for a commodity from the lumberyard, the idea of gift is almost lost. What can we who recognize the debt possibly give back? The blackberries clawed at Franz Dolp's sleeves as he forced himself through the bramble. Salmonberry, grabbing an ankle, threatened to pull him down the nearly vertical hill, but you can't fall far before the thicket, eight feet tall, will trap you like Br'er Rabbit in the briar patch. You lose any sense of direction and tangle. 
The only way is up, toward the ridge top. Clearing trail is the first step. Nothing else is possible without access, and so he pressed on, machete swinging. Tall and lean in field pants and the tall rubber work boots that are endemic in this muddy, thorny terrain, he wore a black baseball cap pulled low. With artists' hands and worn work gloves, he was a man who knew how to sweat. That night, he wrote in his journal, This is work I should have started in my twenties, not my mid-fifties. All afternoon, he lopped and slashed a way toward the ridge, hacking blindly through the brush, his rhythm broken only by the clang of the blade off an obstacle hidden in the brambles. A huge old log, shoulder-high, cedar by the looks of it. They were only milling Douglas fir in those early days, so they left the other trees to rot. Only thing is, cedar doesn't rot. It can last for a hundred years on the forest floor, maybe more. This one was a remnant of the missing forest, left over from the first cut more than a century ago. It was too big to cut through and a long way around, so Franz just created another bend in the trail. Today, now that the old cedars are nearly gone, people want them. They scrounge old clear cuts for the logs that were left behind. Shake bolting, they call it turning old logs into high-priced cedar shakes. The grain is so straight, the shakes split right off. It's amazing to think that within the lifetime of those old trees on the ground, they have gone from being revered, to being rejected, to nearly being eliminated. And then somebody looked up and noticed they were gone and wanted them again. My tool of preference was a cutter mattock commonly known in this area as a maddox, Franz wrote. With this sharp edge, he could chop roots and grade trail, defeating, if briefly, the march of the vine maples. It took several more days of wrangling impenetrable bush to break through to the ridgetop, where a view of Mary's Peak was the reward. I remember the exhilaration as we reached a certain point and savored our accomplishment. Also, the days when with the slopes and the weather contributing mightily to the feeling that everything had gotten out of hand, and we just fell down laughing. Franz's journals record his impressions of the view from the ridge, across a crazy quilt landscape, the panorama broken up into forestry management units, polygons of dead brown and mottled patches of gray and green, next to, quote-unquote, dense plantations of young fir like sections of manicured lawn, in squares and wedges, all broken up like shards of shattered glass on the mountain. Only at the top of Mary's Peak, within the boundaries of a preserve, is there a continuous span of forest, rough, textured, and multi-hued from a distance, the signature of the old-growth forest, the forest that used to be. My work grew out of a deeply experienced sense of loss, he wrote, the loss of what should be here. When the coast range was first opened to logging in the 1880s, the trees were so big, 300 feet tall and 50 feet around, that the bosses didn't know what to do with them. Eventually, two poor sods were told to man the misery whip, a thin, two-man cross-cut saw that they pulled for weeks to fell the behemoths. These were the trees that built the cities of the West, which grew and then demanded even more. They said in those days, you could never cut all the old growth. About the time the chainsaws last growled on these slopes, Franz was planting apple trees and thinking of cider, with his wife and kids on a farm hours away. A father, a young professor of economics, he was investing in home economics, his dream of an Oregon homestead embedded in the forest like the one he grew up on, and where he would stay forever. Unknown to him, while he was raising cows and kids, the blackberries got started in the full sun above what would become his new land on Shot Pouch Creek. They were doing their work of covering the stump farm and rusting remains of logging chains, wheels, and rails. The salmonberries mingled their thorns with the rolls of barbed wire, 
while Moss reupholstered the old couch in the gully. While his marriage was eroding and running downhill on the home farm, so was the soil at Shot Pouch. The elders came to try to hold it in place, and then the maples. This was a land whose native language was conifer, but now spoke only the slang of leggy hardwoods. Its dream of itself as groves of cedar and fir was gone, lost under the unrelenting chaos of brush. Straight and slow has little chance against fast and thorny. When he drove away from the farm intended for Till death do us part, the woman waving goodbye said, I hope that your next dream turns out better than your last. In his journal, he wrote that he, quote, made the mistake of visiting the farm after it was sold. The new owners had cut it all. I sat among the stumps and the swirling red dust, and I cried. When I moved to Shot Pouch after leaving the farm, I realized that making a new home required more than building a cabin or planting an apple tree. It required some healing for me, and for the land. And so it was that a wounded man moved to live on wounded land at Shot Pouch Creek. This patch of land was in the heart of the Oregon Coast Range, the same mountains where his grandfather had made a hard scrabble homestead. Old family photos show a rough cabin and grim faces, surrounded by nothing but stumps. He wrote, quote, These forty acres were to be my retreat, my escape to the wild, but this was no pristine wilderness. Unquote. The place he chose was near a spot on the map called Burnt Woods. Scalped woods would have been more apt. The land was raised by a series of clear cuts first, the venerable old forest, and then its children. No sooner had the firs grown back than the loggers came for them again. After land is clear-cut, everything changes. Sunshine is suddenly abundant. The soil has been broken open by logging equipment, raising its temperature and exposing mineral soil beneath the humus blanket. The clock of ecological succession has been reset, the alarm buzzing loudly. Forest ecosystems have tools for dealing with massive disturbance evolved from a history of blowdown, landslide, and fire. The early successional plant species arrive immediately and get to work on damage control. These plants, known as opportunistic or pioneer species, have adaptations that allow them to thrive after disturbance. Because resources like light and space are plentiful, they grow quickly. A patch of bare ground around here can disappear in a few weeks. Their goal is to grow and reproduce as fast as possible so they don't bother themselves with making trunks, but rather madly invest in leaves, leaves, and more leaves, born on the flimsiest of stems. The key to success is to get more of everything than your neighbor and to get it faster. That life strategy works when resources seem to be infinite, but pioneer species, not unlike pioneer humans, require cleared land hard work, individual initiative, and numerous children. In other words, the window of opportunity for opportunistic species is short. Once trees arrive on the scene, the pioneers' days are numbered, so they use their photosynthetic wealth to make babies that will be carried by birds, the next clear-cut. As a result, many are berry makers. Salmonberry, elderberry, huckleberry, blackberry... The pioneers produce a community based on the principles of unlimited growth, sprawl, and high-energy consumption, sucking up resources as fast as they can, wresting land from others through competition, and then moving on. When resources begin to run short, as they always will, cooperation and strategies that promote stability, strategies perfected by rainforest ecosystems, will be favored by evolution the breadth and depth of these reciprocal symbioses are especially well-developed in old-growth forests, which are designed for the long haul. Industrial forestry, resource extraction, and other aspects of human sprawl are like salmonberry thickets, swallowing up land, reducing biodiversity, and simplifying ecosystems at the demand of societies always bent on having more 
in 500 years, we exterminated old growth cultures and old growth ecosystems, replacing them with opportunistic culture. Pioneer human communities, just like pioneer plant communities, have an important role in regeneration, but they are not sustainable in the long run. When they reach the edge of easy energy, balance and renewal are the only way forward wherein there is a reciprocal cycle between early and late successional systems, each opening the door for the other. The old growth forest is as stunning in its elegance of function as in its beauty. Under conditions of scarcity, there can be no frenzy of uncontrolled growth or waste of resources. The green architecture of the forest structure itself is a model of efficiency, with layers of foliage in a multi-layered canopy that optimizes capture of solar energy. If we are looking for models of self-sustaining communities, we need look no further than an old-growth forest, or the old-growth cultures they raised in symbiosis with them. Franz's journals recall that when he compared the fragment of old growth he could see in the distance with the raw land at Shot Pouch, where the only remnant of the ancient forest was an old cedar log, he knew he had found his purpose. Displaced from his own vision of how the world should be, he vowed that he would heal this place and return it to what it was meant to be. My goal, he wrote, is to plant an old growth forest. But his ambitions ranged beyond physical restoration. As Franz wrote, it is important to engage in restoration with development of a personal relationship with the land and its living things. In working with the land, he wrote of the loving relationship that grew between them. It was as if I discovered a lost part of myself. After the garden and the fruit trees, his next goal was building a house that would honor the self-sufficiency and simplicity that he sought. His ideal had been to build the cabin from the red cedar, beautiful, fragrant, rot-resistant, and symbolic, left behind by the loggers on the slopes above. But the repeated logging had simply taken too much, so regrettably he had to purchase the cedar timber for the cabin, with the promise that I would plant and grow more cedar trees than would ever be cut for my use. Light weight and highly water repellent, sweet smelling cedar was also the architectural choice for indigenous rainforest peoples. Cedar houses constructed of both logs and planks were emblematic of the region. The wood split so readily that in skilled hands, dimensional boards could be made without a saw. Sometimes trees were felled for lumber, but planks were more often split from naturally fallen logs. Remarkably, Mother Cedar also yielded planks from her living flanks. When a line of wedges of stone or antler were pounded into a standing tree, long boards would pop from the trunk along the straight grain. The wood itself is dead supportive tissue, so the harvest of a few boards from a big tree does not risk killing the whole organism, a practice that redefines our notions of sustainable forestry. Lumber produced without killing a tree. Now, however, industrial forestry dictates how the landscape is shaped and used. To own the land at Shot Pouch, which is designated as timberlands, Franz was required to register an approved forest management plan for his new property. He wryly wrote his dismay that his land was classified not as forest land, but timberland, as if the sawmill was the only possible destiny for a tree. Franz had an old-growth mind in a Douglas fir world. The Oregon Department of Forestry and the College of Forestry at Oregon State University offered Franz technical assistance prescribing herbicides to quell the brush and replanting with genetically improved Douglas fir. If you can ensure plenty of light by eliminating understory competition, Douglas fir makes timber faster than anything else around. But Franz didn't want timber. He wanted a forest. Quote, 
My love of this country motivated me to purchase land at Shot Pouch, he wrote. I wanted to do right here, even if I had little idea of what right meant. To love a place is not enough. We must find ways to heal it. If he used the herbicides, the only tree that could tolerate the chemical rain was Douglas fir, and he wanted all of the species to be present. He vowed to clear the brush by hand. Replanting an industrial forest is back-breaking labor. Crews of tree planters come in, progressing sideways on steep slopes with bulging sacks of seedlings. Walk six feet, dibble in a seedling, tamp it down. Walk six feet, repeat. One species, one pattern. But at that time, there was no prescription for how to plant a natural forest. So Franz turned to the only teacher he had, the forest itself. Observing the locations of species in the few existing old-growth plots, he tried to replicate their patterns on his own land. Douglas fir went on sunny open slopes, hemlock on the shady aspects, and cedar on the dimly lit, wet ground. Rather than getting rid of the young stands of alder and big-leaf maple, as the authorities recommended, he let them stay to do their work of rebuilding soil and planted the shade-tolerant species beneath their canopies. Every tree was marked and mapped and tended. He hand-cleared the brush that threatened to swallow them up until back surgery eventually forced him to hire a good crew. Over time, Franz became a very good ecologist, reading his way through both the printed library and the more subtle library of text, offered by the forest itself. His goal was to match his vision for an ancient forest with the possibilities that the land provided. His journals make it clear that there were times when he doubted the wisdom of his endeavors. He recognized that, no matter what he did, the land would eventually turn back to some sort of forest, whether he slogged up hills with a sack of seedlings or not. Human time is not the same as forest time but time alone is no guarantee of the old-growth forest he imagined. When the surrounding landscape is a mosaic of clear-cut and Douglas fir lawns, it is not necessarily possible for a natural forest to reassemble itself. Where would the seeds come from? Would the land be in a condition to welcome them? This last question is especially critical for the regeneration of, quote, maker of rich women, unquote. Despite its huge stature, cedar has tiny seeds, flakes wafted on the wind from delicate cones not more than half an inch long. 400,000 cedar seeds add up to a single pound. It's a good thing that the adults have a whole millennium to reseed themselves. In the profusion of growth in these forests, such a speck of life has almost no chance at all to establish a new tree. While adult trees are tolerant of the various stresses that an always changing world throws their way, the young are quite vulnerable. Red cedar grows more slowly than the other species who quickly overtop it and steal the sun. Especially after a fire or logging, it is almost entirely outcompeted by species better adapted to the dry, open conditions. If red cedars do survive, Despite being the most shade-tolerant of all the Western species, they do not flourish, but rather bide their time, waiting for a wind throw or a death to punch a hole in the shade. Given the opportunity, they climb that transient shaft of sunlight, step by step, making their way to the canopy. But most never do. Forest ecologists estimate that the window of opportunity for cedars to get started occurs perhaps only twice in a century. So at Shot Pouch, natural recolonization was out. In order to have cedars in the restored forest, Franz had to plant them. Given all cedars' traits, slow growth, poor competitive ability, susceptibility to browsing, wildly improbable seedling establishment, one would expect it to be a rare species,
but it's not. One explanation is that while cedars can't compete well on uplands, they thrive with wet feet in alluvial soils, in swamps and water edges that other species can't stand. Their favorite habitat provides them with a refuge from competition. Accordingly, Franz carefully selected creekside areas and planted them thickly with cedar. The unique chemistry of cedar endows it with both life-saving and tree-saving medicinal properties. Rich with many highly antimicrobial compounds, it is especially resistant to fungi. Rich with many highly antimicrobial compounds, it is especially resistant to fungi. Northwest forests, like any ecosystem, are susceptible to outbreaks of disease, the most significant of which is laminated root rot caused by the native fungus Philinus wary. While this fungus can be fatal for Douglas firs, hemlock, and other trees, the red cedars are blessedly immune. When root rot strikes the others, the cedars are poised to fill in the empty gaps, freed of competition. The tree of life survives in patches of death. After years of working alone to keep the cedar thriving, Franz found someone who shared his notion of a good time, planting trees and chopping salmonberry. Franz's first date with Don was on the ridgetop at Shot Pouch. Over the following 11 years, they planted more than 13,000 trees and created a network of trails with names that reflect intimacy with their 40 acres. Forest service lands are often named something like Management Unit 361. At Shot Pouch, more evocative place names are penned on the hand-drawn trail map of the property. Glass Canyon, Viney Glen, Cow Hip Dip. Even individual trees, remnants of the original forest, are named. Angry Maple, Spider Tree, Broken Top. One word appears on the map more than any other. Cedar Springs, Cedar Rest, Sacred Cedar, Cedar Family. Cedar Family is especially evocative of how cedar often lives in family-like groves. Perhaps in compensation for its difficulty in sprouting from seed, cedar is a champion at vegetative reproduction. Almost any part of the tree that rests on wet ground can take root in a process known as layering. The low, swooping foliage may send roots into moist beds of moss. The flexible branches themselves can initiate new trees, even after they're cut from the tree. Native peoples probably tended the cedar groves by propagating them in this way. Even a young cedar that has tipped over or been flattened by a hungry elk will reorient its branches and start over. The aboriginal names for the tree, Long Life Maker and Tree of Life, are appropriately bestowed. One of the most touching place names on Franz's map is a spot called Old Growth Children. To plant trees is an act of faith. 13,000 acts of faith live on this land. Franz studied and planted studied and planted, making a lot of mistakes and learning as he went. Franz wrote, I was a temporary steward of this land. I was its caretaker. More accurately, I was its caregiver. The devil was in the details, and the devil presented details at every turn. He observed the reaction of the old-growth children to their habitats and then tried to remedy whatever ailed them. Reforestation took on the flavor of tending a garden. This was a forestry of intimacy. When I am on the land, it is very hard to keep from messing around. Planting one more tree, cutting a limb, transplanting what has already been planted to a more favorable spot. I call it anticipatory redistributive naturalization. Don calls it tinkering. <laughs>
Cedar's generosity extends not only to people, but to many other forest dwellers as well. Its tender, low-hanging foliage is among deer and elk's favorite food. You'd think that seedlings hidden under the canopies of everything else would be camouflaged, but they are so palatable that the herbivores hunt them out as if they were hidden chocolate bars, and because they grow so slowly they remain vulnerable at deer height for a long time. The unknowns pervading my work were as pervasive as shade in the forest, Franz wrote. His plan to grow cedars on the stream banks was a good one, except that that's where the beavers also live. Who knew that they would eat cedar for dessert? His cedar nurseries were gnawed into oblivion, so he planted them again, this time with a fence. The wildlife just snickered. Thinking like a forest, he then planted a thicket of willow, beaver's favorite meal along the creek, hoping to distract them from his cedars. I definitely should have met with a council of mice, boomers, bobcats, porcupines, beaver, and deer before I started this experiment, he wrote. Many of these cedars today are gangly teens, all limbs and floppy leader, not yet grown into themselves. Nibbled by the deer and elk, they become even more awkward. Under the tangle of vine maple, they struggle toward light, reaching an arm here, a branch there. But their time is coming. After completing the final plantings, Franz wrote, I may heal the land, yet I have little doubt of the direction that the real benefits flow. But the element of reciprocity is the rule here. What I give, I receive in return. Here, on the slopes of Shot Pouch Valley, I have been engaged less in a personal forestry of restoration than in a forestry of personal restoration. In restoring the land, I restore myself. Maker of rich woman, there is truth in her name. She made Franz rich, too, with the wealth of seeing his vision alive in the world, of giving a gift to the future that only grows more beautiful with time. Of Shot Pouch, he wrote, This was an exercise in personal forestry, but it was also an exercise in the creation of personal art. I could have been painting a landscape or composing a cycle of songs. The exercise in finding the right distribution of trees feels like revising a poem. Given my lack of technical expertise, I could not reconcile myself to the title of Forester, but I could live with the idea that I am a writer who works in the forest and with the forest, a writer who practices the art of forestry and writes in trees. The practice of forestry may be changing, but I am unaware of any instances where proficiency in the arts is sought as a professional qualification by timber companies or schools of forestry. Perhaps that's what we need. Artists as foresters. In his years on the plot, he watched the watershed start to heal from a long history of damage. His journal describes a time travel visit to Shot Pouch 150 years in the future, when the venerable cedars have captured the landscape where an alder thicket once stood. But he knew that in the present, his 40 acres were just a seedling and a vulnerable one at that. Meeting his goal would require many more careful hands and hearts and minds, too. Through his art on the land and on the page, he had to help shift people toward the worldview of old-growth cultures, a renewal of relationship to land. Old-growth cultures like old-growth forests have not been exterminated. The land holds their memory and the possibility of regeneration. They are not only a matter of ethnicity or history, but of relationships born out of reciprocity between land and people. Franz showed that you can plant an old-growth forest, but he also envisioned the propagation of an old-growth culture. 
a vision of the world, whole and healed. To further this vision, Franz co-created the Spring Creek Project, whose, quote, challenge is to bring together the practical wisdom of the environmental sciences, the clarity of philosophical analysis, and the creative, expressive power of the written word to find new ways to understand and reimagine our relationship to the natural world. His notion of foresters as artists and poets as ecologists takes root in the forest and in the cozy cedar cabin at Shot Pouch. It has become a place of inspiration and solitude for writers, writers who could be the restoration ecologists of relationship. Writers who could be like birds in a thicket of salmonberry, carrying seeds to a wounded land, making it ready for renewal of old growth culture. The cabin is a gathering spot for fertile collaborations among artists, scientists, and philosophers whose works are then expressed in a dazzling array of cultural events. His inspiration has become a nurse log for the inspiration of others. Ten years, 13,000 trees, and countless inspired scientists and artists later. He wrote, I had confidence now that when it came time for me to rest, I could step aside and let others pass upon a path to a very special place. To a forest of giant fir, cedar, and hemlock, to the ancient forest that was. He was right, and many have followed the path he blazed from weedy brambles to old-growth children. Franz Dolp passed away in 2004 in a collision with a paper mill truck on his way to Shot Pouch Creek. Outside the door of his cabin, the circle of young cedars look like women in green shawls, beaded with raindrops catching the light, graceful dancers in feathery fringe that sways with their steps. They spread their branches wide, opening the circle, inviting us to be part of the dance of regeneration. Clumsy at first, from generations of sitting on the sidelines, we stumble until we find the rhythm. We know these steps from deep memory, handed down from Skywoman, reclaiming our responsibility as co-creators. Here, in a homemade forest, poets, writers, scientists, foresters, shovels, seeds, elk, and alder join in the circle with Mother Cedar, dancing the old-growth children into being. We are all invited. Pick up a shovel and join the dance. This has been Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. This was chapter 24, Old Growth Children. Thanks for reading along.